Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Skip, thank you. Um, we appreciate that introduction, and it's great to have a supporter, uh, both of the Commonwealth Club and the Carter Center, able to give us that welcome. Um, good evening. Welcome, everybody, to the Commonwealth Club. Um, uh, as Skip noted, my name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president and CEO of the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, and I'm really pleased to be here tonight for what I think is an important conversation with uh, a friend and longtime colleague, Paige Alexander, um, who heads the Carter Center. Uh, the Packard Foundation has been a longtime supporter of the Carter Center, including an early contribution by our founder, David Packard, to the Carter Center. Um, and we share a dedicated interest in advancing global development. And as we'll talk about today, global development gains are deeply threatened when democracy is threatened around the world. Um, and we have seen in recent weeks, uh, both in Brazil and clearly here in the US, the ways in which democracy is challenged in different ways. Um, and uh, I think the conversation is important about how do we support, how do we, de how do we nourish democracy. It's one of the most pressing issues facing our world today. And so I very much look forward to talking with Paige tonight about these issues. Um, so let's get started. Paige, you and I first met in 2010 when we were both working for USAID on global development and democracy issues around the world. And I recall some very <laughs> tense moments during the Arab Spring and during the Syria uh, problems. And here we are today and you are at the Carter Center, which has a long, long history of working on democracy issues around the world, and yet you are pivoting to addressing US democracy. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you feel about that pivot and why the pivot. Sure, well, it's great to be here with you, Nancy, and thank you to everyone who came. You know, when I took the job at the Carter Center, much like when you were leaving Washington and came to the Packard Foundation, we had spent our careers doing international development. And so I was coming from, the, I had been living in Europe and I come home and it's June 1st, 2020. And I get off the plane and I'm greeted by the CDC and they say, have you been to Iran or China because of COVID? Now that was the day after we had lifted the mask mandate, they had opened the tattoo parlors, they had done everything in Georgia to make Georgia essentially bit of a viral stew of COVID. And I thought, that's odd, those are the CDC questions. I get in the car, drive down Peachtree Street, and I see the aftermath of the George Floyd protest. It was literally the day after, so there were broken windows, there were burned buildings. I get to my parents' house, they've got the TV on, and it's the President of the United States tear gassing Lafayette Square. And I picked up the, I, first I cried, as my parents were like, I know, we're so happy you're home. And I was like, that's actually not why I'm crying. I called President mm. Carter and I said, I don't know how we will be credible doing the work we've done and that you've done overseas for 40 years if we're not doing this in our own backyard. And so that was the start of why the Carter Center ended up taking you know, essentially the international experience and the comparative advantage I thought we had doing 115 elections in 40 different countries. How are we gonna look at this domestically? You know, we only get involved internationally when on election work and on democracy work when there's the potential for success of democracy moving forward or there's a real backslide. There's political polarization, there's racial, ethnic injustice, uh, and there's a question about the validity of an election. Those are all the things that get us involved in elections overseas. And it was sad to realize that's the situation we were in here in the US. So as we looked at how we were going to take these opportunities and experiences overseas, which also worked on 
conflict resolution, you know, programs we do in Mali, we're actually doing those programs in Central Florida now, you start getting to the point where there are lessons to be learned. I mean, if the pandemic taught us anything, it was that there are no barriers. You know, the global situation, whether it's global health or whether it's democracy, we share these experiences in real time now. So the Carter Center decided to get involved, and that's what we started in 2020. We've done this in 2022, and we'll continue to do it. But we are using the same tactics that, I wouldn't say tactics, the same opportunities that we've had to do human rights work, violence mitigation, racial injustice, all of these uh, opportunities that we have worked on overseas, we're now doing in our own backyard. Paige, thank you for that. And I want to add for um, everybody who's here, just a quick note about today's format. Right. Um, and that first is that we have a live audience here in San Francisco and viewers around the country who are watching on YouTube. So all of you, no matter how or where you're watching, you can submit questions um, either for Paige or for me. And if you're watching online, please post the questions in the chat feature of YouTube. And the questions will be brought to us throughout the program. Um, for on-site questions, you can use the cards in your seat. So if you have questions right. about any of these answers or parts uh, of the conversation. And, and let me turn this to you, Nancy, because obviously the Packard Foundation, you know, the views on global democracy, the real question comes out is, why is it important for global democratic practices to be happening for, to create a equal and just society that the Packard Foundation is working on? Yeah, thanks, Paige. Uh, you know, as you and I both experienced over the past several <laughs> decades, um, you know, we had this flourishing of global democracy in the 90s. And then we started having a, a decline starting about 2010, where there was a decline in global democracy, there was an increase in conflict, particularly conflicts inside of countries. And so for those of us who, work on, who worked on global development, we saw that we could not sustain the gains when you did not have a government that was responsive to the needs of its people, that wasn't inclusive, and all those factors you just said about fragmented societies, marginalized communities, you had a fragility within the country that made it unable to uh, um, survive uh, the impacts of weather or political events, and so, any gains that you made could be washed away. So what it really makes you realize is that you've got to work on the system itself, uh, the system of democracy or, or governance that enables people to both make and sustain core development gains. So whether it's around the world or here in this country, um, we understand that you need that container uh, to be functioning and to be healthy. And that's, um, I think, one of the core uh, areas uh, of, of focus uh, if we want to, to make good on right. what our aspirations are. At the Packard Foundation, um, what, what we have done over the past several years is really create that understanding as the basis for our work, is that when you have just and inclusive and equitable societies, you can sustain those gains. You can make the gains on climate change. You can make the gains on on health um, and on ocean health or women's um, equity. So it's really at the heart of right. all the work that we need to do. Yeah, I, the, the, the construct of the world needing a base to build from. I mean, we talk a lot in international development work that some of these processes are linear. You have, you have a catastrophe, there's humanitarian aid, there's the conflict resolution piece, and then there's longer term development. A lot of the work that we're doing is overlapping right now. And so you're having, you're having climate issues, you're at, you know, it, it's been quite rainy out here in California. Yes. Uh, you know, and you, you are having these issues at the same time as you're having people blame somebody else. It's a us versus them mentality. And we've seen that in so many conflicts overseas. 
And yet now we're here, here we are in the United States trying to tackle those different pieces. And it takes, it's not just policy, it's not just government, it actually takes civil society, it takes foundation work, it takes organizations that are willing to be on the ground and have long-term uh, long credibility to have these conversations to move us to a new stage. So I think that yeah. this, is a, you know, this is why these type of relationships are very important as well, and why the community needs to be having conversations and realizing it's not just about what's happening in our own, your own backyard, it's actually happening throughout the world, and where can you be part of it? There's a wonderful quote by a professor at the Kennedy School at Harvard uh, by Arkan Fung. Okay. Um, and he says, democracy is a miracle because it enables people who disagree with each other to live together peacefully. And that miracle is what is fraying, particularly here. Mm -hmm. So when we think about the number of colleagues that we have ju who, just like us, used to work internationally and now work um, here in, in this country, as we've seen the fraying of our democracy. Um, Paige, I know you've given a lot of thought to this in terms of what are the lessons that you're able to bring, uh, particularly the electoral work that the Carter Center has done around the world that you're now doing here in this country. Yeah, it, so it was eye-opening to me, again, coming back from Europe, and the last election I had monitored was in Ukraine, and that was, you know, you're sitting on a cold bench in a room until 2.30 in the morning, essentially watching paint dry as you're watching them count the votes. It's, you know, it is a fairly simple process that somehow had become hugely <clears throat> polarized here in the United States. So the last one I had seen had been in Ukraine, and then COVID hit, I come back, I take the job at the Carter Center, and the next one I see is in North Georgia in Rabin County, and I go in wearing my Carter Center t-shirt, which was blue. Little did I know that was a bad idea to wear a blue shirt when you're trying to be a nonpartisan observer, because blue had been usurped as the color. So yeah, the color of, of one party, even though President Carter had green as his color, I will just remind people. Uh, but the, the color blue existed, and I had immediately, they tried to put me in a certain area of the room, even though we had been approved by the Secretary of State's office to actually be the only nonpartisan observer doing the risk limiting audit recount in Georgia the first one. There were two more after it, but the first one is the one that counted. So uh, so that was, one was a perception issue that actually a lot of things matter, color matters. Uh, the, the second was we needed partners. We at the Carter Center are always going to be assumed to be from a Democratic Party, you know, Democratic president. But we are working with the Bush Institute and the Baker Center and the McCain Institute because those are the type of partners we have to have to make sure that we're seen not as singularly partisan. At the same time, we don't want to be seen as partisan at all, so it's hard to say we're the Democrat and that's the Republican group. So we go in, we work with a lot of organizations, we find a left-leaning lead and a right-leaning lead for all of the work that we do. I'll give an example, we were in North Carolina, there are 14 counties in North Carolina, and we did a bus tour. And when you get the, the former mayor of a small town in North Carolina, both a Republican and a Democrat, to come in and do a town hall meeting and explain to their neighbors that there are not little men in the machine changing the votes, it actually is relevant. And they're listening to their neighbors because all of us listen to people, you know, they don't want me flying in from Atlanta and telling them in Arizona how to do things. People listen to neighbors. So that, that part of the conversation is what we learned at the village level in Zambia uh, when mm. we were trying to begin a process of empowering youth and women to be active in the political process or what we're doing in Sudan now with when they overthrew their government, it was youth leaders who came forward and doctors who came forward and did that, but then they weren't listened to as part of government. So how do you work, not just during the election, but in between elections to build that? And, and Paige, y y you talked about the importance of being bipartisan right. um, or nonpartisan, as I think a lot of us are trying to, to talk about. But you know, um, we both have the experience of working around the world on, in conflict, post-conflict situations where you know, we really expect looking into those countries that people who have been in a terrible conflict 
figure out how to get along together because otherwise their country won't move forward, whether it's Bosnia or Rwanda or, you know, name a country, that conflict resolution is a whole important aspect of it. So there are a lot of tools and approaches that I think people are starting to bring to this country. But I think there's also a sense, a growing sense and a disturbing sense that we just can't bridge that divide, even, even though some of these other countries have had far more egregious recent um, violent. terrible violent events. Um, but how, how, what has your experience been with that as you've tried to bring that toolbox to the United States? Uh, so, you know, we look at, at things, again, the experiences we have overseas, when we are working with candidates, they'll sign the candidate's principle. We're working on an election administration that says they will respect the honesty, the integrity of the election, the transparency, the security. They sign a candidate's principle. We do that overseas all the time. Trying to get that done here in the US was quite remarkable. There are like 12 constructs of the candidate principles we use overseas. And here in the US, we can only get Republican and Democratic candidates to agree on five. So that was an important element to at least get them to agree on those five. And then we would have them sign. So in Georgia, for example, Stacey Abrams and Brian Kemp signed it well before the election and said they will respect the outcome of the election. And so once you have the basis of that, we had candidates running against each other in you know 170 places sign and say that they would actually respect the results. That starts to normalize and bring it back to where it needed to be. Uh, I did a CNN op-ed with Gleaves Whitney from the Ford Institute talking about you know, President Ford and President Carter. They obviously ran against each other and won one, yet the, the, the similarity of the time then versus what was happening now in 2022 was that people expect integrity in an election. They expect their the politicians to be honest. And so we're trying to bring that back to the forefront. And again, it's not political per se, because it's not just the politicians that are doing this, it's the neighbors, it's people amongst themselves. So bringing some of the skill sets we have, whether it's the candidate principles, uh, whether it's these road shows that we're doing to get a left-leaning, a right-leaning lead, democracy resilience networks is what we have been calling them in Arizona, in Florida, in Michigan, in North Carolina, in Georgia. And we'll probably look to expand this in 2024 because we have learned some lessons from each of these places. I will also say the difficulty in the US, unlike overseas and you know, all the elections that we have done, these countries have a central election commission. They have one law that rules the entire country for the election. Georgia, we have 159 different counties and the, the voting poll, the polls can open at, close at seven or they can close at six, depends what county. Can be open on a Saturday or maybe not open on a Saturday for early voting. So when you're dealing with the challenges that come with the United States, it's 50 different elections, and then going down to the specificity of each county being able to have some of their own election laws, it makes it very difficult to do that type of work. So again, it's a matter of talking to, uh, to neighbors and getting people to have the conversations and engage that way. So, and I'm curious for you, Nancy, that, you know, we want to be hopeful. <laughs> so much of what we want to do, uh, looking at internationally, there are some negative sides. You know, the Freedom House report talks a lot about the the backsliding of democracy in America, but also in 16 other countries in the world. That you know, the, that we've had every year. There have been 16 years solid that we've had backsliding in democracy globally. You have a social network now that allows people to talk to each other instantaneously. You have the disinformation and misinformation that's out there. But what makes you hopeful about the direction we're going? Uh, and I'm hoping you have something that makes you hopeful. <laughs> yeah. You know, probably similar to your experience of going to Atlanta and seeing some of these very egregious symptoms of uh, the frame of our democracy or the challenges to our right. democracy. Um, at Packard, we looked at how some of the core issues that we care deeply about were not able to get traction given the state of our democracy. So two years ago, we added a democracy uh, rights and governance program in the United States to our portfolio. 
and over the last couple of years have had a chance to get to know and support a number of wonderful partners like the Carter Center. And um, we put some immediate effort because of the urgency of the midterms into electoral integrity, um, support for the very courageous election officials and poll watchers, um, addressing myths and disinformation and trying to uh, keep some of the most terrible state laws from going onto the books. Right. And I think everyone who's watched the midterms feels pretty good about those results. Um, we were, I, I think collectively, we saw people understood that there was a threat to our democracy that they needed to take seriously. Some 70% of voters listed that as one of their top concerns. Mm -hmm. We saw the extraordinary effort by poll watchers and election officials to make sure that those elections were well administered, sometimes against great odds and with not very much funding, right. um, and that they were credible and seen as legitimate. Um, a number of key states did not have election deniers elected, although I will note that some 31% of our country across 16 states still has an election denier as their governor, their secretary of state, their AG, or some other position of power over elections. So I'm hopeful because a lot of work, a lot of effort, and a lot of mobilization um, made the difference in the midterms. And we came out with, with elections that were credible, that did hold. Right. And I'm hopeful I'm going to keep this in a positive frame, <laughs> that that momentum continues into the 24 elections and that people act on that concern that they voiced at the polls, that we have convergence over understanding why people have concerns about our democracy. Um, and we work both to keep the 24 elections credible, but that we also look at what are some of the other pernicious underpinnings of of the the fragility that we're seeing in our country, you know, and certainly some of the depths of racism, um, the um, the inability of our government to consistently deliver for its citizens, and we're seeing um, a, a, a steep uh, and considerable decrease over the last 25 years in citizen trust that the government is acting on their behalf versus on behalf of big government, and we see that's a fear that gets played on, um, and that fans people into having even more distrust for their governments, for, for the US government. And so we, we have, I think, a huge opportunity with these funds that are coming out of the government now through the um, Inflation Reduction Act and the Bill Act and the Chips and Science Act to help those funds land equitably and effectively um, but we, we will need to, all of us, stay focused and engaged on all the ways that democracy can be strengthened, can be shored up, and remain credible and deliver for all of us equitably. And, and, and talking about equitable delivery, you know, the Carter Center, Mrs. Carter, 50 years ago, started focusing on mental health issues. And she wanted to destigmatize the issues around mental health and the needs, uh, you know, equitable needs socially to have these things addressed. So then you fast forward to election administrators who are getting doxxed, who are being threatened, who are literally having breakdowns. And how do you bring that mental health component into making sure people understand that what you're doing is actually, you know, devaluing the common cause of democracy. And so, you know, at the Carter Center, we put together a mental health resource guide for election administrators that every secretary of state, almost every secretary of state said, this is important for our election administrators to understand. You need to watch out for your neighbor. You need to watch out for the person who is, you know, taking your license as you're going in to vote. If they are so nervous and so on edge, then there's actually a problem and we need to address it. So there, there's a cross cutting issue that I think the problems with the democracy, the problems with our global health system have actually brought out and raised some of these other issues which otherwise have been quite quiet before. Uh, and I think mental health is a place that 
you know, is a common ground that everyone now, you know, after COVID, you have someone in your family, you know somebody who's had a mental health issue, and how we get attention to that. That's part of a democratic process of, you know, all, all ships rise, you know, with the tide, trying to get those issues. So I think there's some cross-cutting issues that have come out with the, the backsliding in democracy, the civility level had gone down, but I think it's a pendulum swing now. And I think people are expecting their politicians to actually have some sort of decorum. And so we're getting back to a place, I'm hopeful because I think we're getting back to a place. I, I think many people here and, and, and knowing coming from the Carter camp, I know what the stories were like in previous administrations. And I know talking to my parents when they thought things had never been so bad. And I say to my kids, things have never been so bad. And we now need to look at that and say, oh, so, so how do we come back from that? And I think bringing attention to it, educating our, our youth uh, is also part of that. And I think we're on the path to do that. I think we took it for granted. It's the bottom line is I think we took our democracy for granted and now uh, we're having to address it. And it's great to find organizations that are willing to support that and groups that are willing to be on the ground and citizens who are willing to be part of it. Yeah, I think that taking it for granted is a really key point. Um, the, and that if we don't now get very serious about it and protect and renew our democracy right. and strengthen it, that it has repercussions not just in this country, but overseas. And it going back to your opening help. comment about the lack of credibility to work around the world on democracy issues when we're having the same issues going on here. And if one isn't able to be credible on democracy, then all of our development gains are at risk. And this has global impacts. I mean, we are of the world, uh, and we will see that continuing. Yeah. I mean, talking, you know, just looking this week about Brazil, for example, you know, it, it, their Janu our January 6th was their January 8th. How they handle it, what the rule of law looks like mm -hmm. when they try to handle that is going to be quite interesting because lessons are learned. And this is why it's been so important in the U.S. that, that everything goes through a court system, that we have a process that allows the pendulum to swing back a little bit. Uh, and so we're teaching bad you know, there, there were, 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 uh, bad lessons are being learned from the experiences that we have had. And so now we need to get back to, we are the world's greatest democracy. We are the first democracy. It is important that we have those lessons that, that we are able to show you can slide far to one side and still at the end of the day, come back to a, a set of systems, a set of laws that, that keep us grounded. Yeah, and I think there's an interesting question. I wonder how you think about it, um, going back to the taking our democracy for granted around the, the lack of civics classes mm. being taught anymore, uh, the lack of, of sort of sustained civic engagement or, or a sense of citizen responsibilities. So there's government responsibilities right. that aren't being met, but there are similarly uh, big gaps of, of citizen engagement, and I you know, clear, many, many people are around the country are avid volunteers. We are enormously grateful to the courageous poll watchers and election workers who volunteer. Um, but there, there, isn't, there isn't the civics emphasis that used to be a part of your standard curriculum. Yeah, when, when I came in in 2020, the first thing I thought, and uh, one reason is because President Carter, if you're at the museum, if you come to Atlanta and go to the museum, some of you will remember the, uh, some of the videos from the energy crisis. And uh, there was one video, I remember Schoolhouse Rocks was the name of it. And it said, you know, I'm just a bill, I'm only a bill, and I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. And it's a very catchy tune. And as a kid, that's how I learned about our governance structure. And then when I was in the museum, I saw that you know, President Carter used to tell people, just put a sweater on if you're cold, don't turn your heat up. We're in the middle of an energy crisis now. He, he also put solar panels on the roof of the White House, which you know, if we had done that in 1979 across the, you know, the United States, we'd be in a different place. But those are the type of civic education that needs to come into the grade school classes, those need to be things that people understand. This is just baseline knowledge. And you can't, you know, everyone is not entitled to their own facts. 
you know, and many, great, you, a fact is a fact. So, you know, having these facts taught at, a, you know, at that level, having these be weaved into community programs, um, and again, when we did our, uh, our bus tours in North Carolina, the people who came to the room, not everyone asked a question, but they were willing to sit there and listen and have uh, their neighbors ask questions that they might have been thinking, but they were afraid to ask and have experts on the stage answering them. We didn't fly someone in from Washington to explain how a machine works. We actually had local citizens talk about it. And the same goes with election uh, monitoring. You know, I, I did election monitoring both for the early, uh, the early days in Georgia this past election, as well as election day. And again, it is like watching paint dry. And people are there doing their civic duty, voting, you know, helping people cast their vote. And I'm sitting in a room that have partisan observers too, and we're all watching. The partisan observers are looking over my shoulder because I've got a 12-page check sheet that we have to do uh, you know, to make sure that things are happening right. They were just there to watch because they were convinced if they were there, nothing bad would happen. And so it's that cynicism that sort of come, seeps into people's belief. And so I do think that education is an important area for us to make sure that when people know they don't question as much. And so, but it has to come from trusted voices. And uh, so, I, I mean, I think we see this at the village level throughout, you know, in Myanmar, when we go into an election because we think that there's gonna be a lack of credibility or in Tunisia a couple of weeks ago, you know, those are the conversations that we have with people on the ground. Like, why are you voting? And after they vote, do you feel like your vote was counted safely? We watch the whole process. And when people know it's not a surprise. And so we need to get back to that space because the world's moving very quickly. You know, Dominion voting machine in Georgia, you know, it's not a hanging chat anymore. Like there is a paper ballot that goes along with an electronic ballot, but people don't realize that they actually do go together. It's not just a QR code, it's a full paper ballot. So walking through the process of showing people, we've moved on from hanging chads, but we do want to have some sort of paper trail. So Georgia happens to be one of the better uh, systems. I'm not just saying that because I'm from Atlanta. <laughs> so. But it, do, it does underscore the fact right. that we have, um, as a country, deeply underfunded yeah. our elections, um, which is you know, not something that's on everybody's right. top shopping list. But uh, they're, they're, uh, in, in getting to know some of the election officials and administrators around the country, during the midterms, it's it's shocking what they're scraping by to make do with. Right. And so getting our election system itself adequately funded is one of those sort of wonky details that is really critical. Right. Um, the other the other um, aspect I would note is is to your point of trusted messengers. Um, another of our partners, Issue One, did a wonderful campaign called Faces of Democracy, where they humanized the people, the poll watchers, the election officials, um, in, in a campaign that made it real. Like the, it, there was such a social media effort uh, to rile people up against the legitimacy of the elections. So it was a counter for that that I think actually did make a difference in the midterms. And I think there are a number of those kinds of lessons that we'll want to carry forward into the 24 presidential elections. Yeah, I, I can't agree more. The wonky aspects of an election, I mean, no one should know who the Secretary of State of Georgia is, really. You should not know Brad Rassenberger's name, I mean, or Gabe Sterling. I mean, no one needs to know that, but because the wonkiness has now come down to misinformation, disinformation, it means that these people are vilified, and so, making sure you bring it back to voters, you know, uh, as issue one did with that campaign, which was wonderful. And they did a lot of polling, which we ended up using. And again, that's part of the partnership. There are so many groups working in this, but if you work in silos, you're not gonna get the information out. So for us, it was really important that any groups that you funded, that Partnership for American Democracy, that any of the, the new funders that we had, along with our own money, because President Carter agreed we could put our own money into this, 
uh, that we were working collectively because I think that, that we were leveraging each other's support because a lot of us were new in this area and we knew what we know overseas. You know, we know in Myanmar, we're training local people to be able to monitor the media so then they can put together, you know, aggregate news stories and share it with policy leaders. We can do that in Myanmar. How do we do that here in the U.S.? How do we make sure that if someone is saying, as, um, as they did this week in one news cycle that was not mainstream news, talked about the fact that the Carter Center had worked in Arizona and we had worked in Brazil. Hmm, people in Arizona are now thinking that somehow we turned elections in two places. But that's an echo chamber that doesn't get to mainstream media. But how did we know that? Because we were able to track it. And so that's, you know, you can't answer every scary story that comes out about you. Otherwise, you're going to spend a lot of time with the whack-a-mole situation. But these stories do come out. And how do you discount them, you know, respectfully, because some people truly believe that the sky is purple, it is not blue. So how do you get, you know- oh, Or birds aren't real. Yes, yes, you know, here's the color blue. Does it really look the same? You know, to do things respectfully. So uh, we're, that is one of the areas that we're, you know, I think respect and showing the, the people's faces. Have I given you enough time to go through the questions? We've got now? some so, great okay. <laughs> questions here. So I'm gonna try to group a couple of them. Um, there are three questions that are basically around media. It's, are we working with social media company, companies on this issue? Can we address the decline of newspapers in the US and the impact on democracy? And what part does journalism play in supporting or undermining worldwide democracy? What role does civic education? So, um, it, you know, we certainly think a lot about this at the Packard Foundation, but do you wanna? I'll Sure, I'll start. So we do. We work with a number of social media monitoring companies that we are now uh, certified to inform them when disinformation is coming through. So this is uh, this you know, being ha out here in California is a pr uh, an example of some of the relationships we have now because the Carter Center had done this overseas and we had built up credibility with Facebook and others, and now we're doing this in the U.S. And so we can help verify the truth truthfulness of stories. Um, so that, that's on that piece. Civic education, as I had talked about, the need at, at the elementary, middle school, you know, and secondary level. Um, but we also need it in the law school. And so when you're talking about, when you're looking at election law, and again, some of the wonky pieces of it, you know, how many lawyers are trained in election law? That's not part of a legal curriculum. And so we're now starting to weave that into working with the American Bar Association and others to make sure the education piece is worked in. So it's media, education, oh, and journalists. The, you know, we have the Rosalind Carter Journalist Fellows who cover mental health as an example. And they have been covering these issues because we can only do so much, but when a journalist writes about something, whether it's print, whether it's broadcast, whether it's radio, when they learn the language to cover certain stories in a sensitized way, and this for mental health is a very important aspect, uh, it gets to a broader audience. So we are going to look at you know, models such as that as we move forward and talk about elections. So it's not just, you know, Fox News versus MSNBC, but it's your hometown newspapers covering election observation. There was just one in, uh, in Holland, Michigan, which I particularly liked. We had the election, one of the election administrators uh, from Holland, Michigan, come out to Tunisia with us two weeks ago. And he just did, he had an interview, and there was a story about what he, as an election administrator in Michigan, learned from watching the elections in Tunisia. Hmm. And so those are the stories that get you know, down to, to the granular of elections are elections, and they might be different in different places, but at the same, uh, there, there is a similarity across the board. How about you? Yeah, I mean, I would just add that um, I, I think those are very linked questions. The mm -hmm. decline of local journalism is directly related to um, both the the rise of social media yeah. and you know just the general trajectory of how journalism and news is pervaded in our country um, there is a lot of effort to think about how to revive local journalism for all the reasons that we've already touched on in terms of giving people a local trusted source of what's going on and not the franchises of local papers that are all actually from a single source, but bona fide local journalists covering local stories. 
um, and partly as a way of counteracting the very pernicious social media issues or, or the, the rampant um, disinformation that circulates on social media, which also has often global impact, getting mm -hmm. back to the copycat <laughs> sort of Brazil, January 8th. Um, I, I think the big question on the social media is, you know, how do we take what in 2010, when Paige and I were working on the Arab Spring, and social media was the hero, because right. it really it, it enabled people to communicate with each other and organize and come out um, against repressive governments. And fast forward to 23, and social media is the problem right. because it does spread these m very pernicious untruths, misinformation. And so it, I, I think this is one of the key issues for us to understand and address. Um, what is, you know, how do you take what is good about social media that so many of us rely on, and how, w what are the fixes? So without addressing or undermining free speech, you know, how do you get at those algorithms? How do you get more responsibility in the tech companies? And you know, as right. we are here in the heart of the tech world, um, this, this I think is, is, a, is a really core issue. And in enabling journalism, to flourish once again. Right, right. Um, I, by, uh, uh, this is a great question, and I appreciate it because it's important to underscore saying both of you focus primarily on elections. What about the institutional failures throughout our system? The institutional failures seem to resist reform regardless of election outcomes. Um, uh, I'll start by saying I, I put this squarely as part of a fragility diagnosis. It's when a government, broadly speaking, cannot deliver for its citizens. And we have seen in the United States at a federal level a, a persistent defunding and, and more recently gutting of a lot of our federal agencies such that they really don't have the capacities to do some of what they need to do. Um, and then we see that at our county and our city levels. If you look at the American Rescue Plan Act funds that really helped many, many Americans not suffer the worst of, of the, the COVID pandemic, um, it was a stretch for local governments to be able to deliver those effectively, right. equitably, and efficiently. And so we don't... There, there are so many reasons that one could diagnose for that, but focusing on governance is as important as focusing on democracy, which is why we think about our program as democracy, rights, and governance um, as all inextricably linked for enabling the kind of sustained progress that, that we all want to see. Yeah, I, and I'll say, as well, we, we run a program called Inform Women, Transform Lives. And this is because we realized that access to information was not getting down to certain levels uh, in the community. And so the failures of our system are that sometimes these community programs exist and no one knows about them. Yep. So we're in 24 Which cities. is why local journalism would be good. Right, exactly. These stories are important because that's how the word gets out. So you know, for our program in 24 cities around the world, and I'll say in the US, it's Chicago, Washington, and Atlanta, there are programs that are being run at the city level that people don't know about, and especially the women. And so how do you get those messages out? How do you help city government get the messages out because you know, people who are working in government don't necessarily know how to reach those populations. You would right. think that they do, but that's why it takes sort of elevating those voices. Uh, for our programs, we now, we have um, murals. If you go to our website, you can see there are murals around the world that talk about, you know, on playgrounds. So women are seeing how they can access these services because they're beautiful murals and then they have the information on it. You'll see buses in Chicago. They've got it on the side of the buses. You know, there's a number you can call and you can get a three-in-one card that is going to give you access to services that 
women don't know they have access to, but you know, there's been a 300% uptick in Chicago on just use of these cards once we started launching that campaign. So I think there is a failure at the federal level, the state level, and the, and the city level. And so the places where thing, good things are being done, we need to elevate that. And uh, so it's not just elections. And as I said, it's not just during the elections. It's the time in between working in Sudan on youth citizen observation to make sure that they are holding the government accountable to the changes they said that they would make in between the election period. I think that that's, you know, that is part of raising the bar and democracy writ large. It's not just about the elections, it's about year round, and it's about how government serves you and how you can serve government and get involved. Yeah, and one of the things that we think about in philanthropy, just building on your examples, is how, do, how can we contribute in a way that facilitates those government services from being more available, um, both in terms of supporting citizen voices right. to make the, uh, the demand side um, vigorous and accountable, but also the, an example with the American Rescue Plan Act was that there was this amazing program that with the child tax care credits that is credited with cutting childhood pro poverty in half for the duration of its existence during, during COVID. But it was really important to enable people to access that information. Right. And, and so philanthropy helped to create a navigator that was an app that made it very easy and accessible for people to apply for, especially if you were a non-native English speaker or a non-filer. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it's, it's no longer in existence, but hopefully will be at some point. <laughs> well, and, and, and it, it reminds me of where we were, uh, remember at AID when Raj was running a program trying to bring attention to childhood poverty under five and, and, and you know, not stunting growth as long as children by, if they got to their fifth birthday, they had a certain uh, systems provided to them. It became a much bigger deal when we had influences start you know, sharing that on social media. So you can have an independent voice, but until you are able to share it more widely, whether it's through local journalists or whether it's through social media, you're just not gonna get the traction. But along with that comes misinformation and disinformation yeah. too, so. This is the upside of social media. Right. Okay, I feel like we need to be singing this, so um, I'll give you the cue and you can do the, the musical page. Oh, that's... How do you solve a problem like our Congress? Okay. <laughs> On the sound of music. Um, I don't think we have enough time for that one. Yeah, so that's one of those big structural yeah. issues that right. maybe in our lifetime will be addressed. Oh, do I really well, actually, well, certainly not gonna sing it. I'm not even, uh, as I said, I'm not sure we have enough uh, time for that. I think. Congress does its own service and disservice to itself. I don't think that we necessarily need to, uh, to take a fire hose on, on the situation that, that we have seen over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I don't know how we solve that except for being present and being part of the process when people are running for office, when your government officials come back to their home state, they come back to their home district, and those are conversations they need to hear because I, I know, having talked to many elected officials, when I share information with them about what we are seeing, they're like, well, I haven't heard that from my constituents. So I think there's a, a need for Congress to be hearing from their own constituents. But I don't know how we solve the problem of Congress. That's, that's too big for me to bite off. Well, I think there are, uh, there are a number of groups um, that are thinking about the structural reforms that, in addition to what you've said, would create more equitable representation. Yeah, that's um, true. But those are a long way off. I think right. that is um, the, the actual structure of Congress itself, primarily in the House of Representatives, where you've right. got outsized influence from very small rural states is, is one of the issues. I think there's also the question of the, um, uh, th that there is an electoral reform act that right. has some chance right. of passing. So it's a, uh, there was, as you may have tracked, a, a, a big um, act that got stalled. Uh, PCA or? The, 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 the electoral account act? 
That no, the, the, that big, uh, the big, um, oh, the big omnibus, the big the overall voter rights. Voter rights. Yes. Yes. Uh, that just it was too right. big and ambitious right. to be able to get through the divided Congress that we have. So uh, the strategy now seems to be how do you take out the pieces that you can work right. on bit by bit on the congressional reform? And then building on your answer, about the lack of responsiveness of Congress, congressional members to their people. There's a question that says, on one level, conversations between neighbors promote understanding on individual and community levels, but please comment on the institutional and organizational influence of dark money and Citizens United, which is anti-democratic and seeks for decades to undermine democracy. What do you suggest? And I think this goes it, this goes to the, the, the polling data that tells us that nine out of 10 people think that government is more likely to serve the interests of, of big, big interests, mm -hmm. not theirs. And this is very much behind a lot of the declining confidence in government, which is very pernicious in a democracy, that people right. don't trust that. And so ways and mechanisms to enable members of Congress to truly hear and listen to people in their districts, often where it isn't highly divided and partisan yeah. um, at a very local level, is I think one of the keys t to unlocking um, some of the gridlock and some of the, some of the distrust that we have in Congress. I, I agree, it's all about transparency. Uh, you know, <clears throat> dark money works on both sides too, and when you saw primary, certain candidates be primaried out of their race, the money wasn't always coming from their own party. And that was actually quite problematic. And so I think transparency, election reform, uh, finance reform, all of those things have been touched on, but uh, it needs to come out of, it's the John Lewis yes. Main Act, yes. yes uh, and it, those pieces need to come out in a way that, that are biteable, uh, bite-sized pieces that, that Congress can say, this is a step in the right direction. They did that with campaign finance reform in a big way, you know, decades ago, uh, but we're there now and we need to get transparency back in the process. And there's a related question on, to what extent do you believe citizens not trust in the outcome of the election to be the consequence of A, not believing the result, or B, feeling like government is not working for them? I'm sorry, start the first part again? The, it, 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 it's the basically, why do, you or, think, yeah. why do you think people aren't believing the outcome of the elections? I, because I think they lack the education of, of knowing, knowing how the system works. And I think clarity in the system, transparency in the system. I mean, in Arizona, <clears throat> Maricopa County, you know, I've spent more time going domestically for an international organization. You know, I, I'm supposed to be traveling overseas. I've been in Michigan, I've been in Arizona, but in Maricopa County, in their rooms similar to this size, their soffits are actually uh, plexiglass. You can see through because people were so worried that votes were going through the ceiling from the, uh, the vote count that things were being hidden, that everything was turned into glass or plexiglass. So I think that once people see and are educated about how the process work, how the machines work, they, there's nothing that they can argue against. And the problem comes when there's a dicing and splicing of a video that looks like votes are being put in a, you know, in a suitcase and moved elsewhere. You, you can't stop that, but you can spend a lot of time educating. And I think election administrators have done a really good job this year in inviting the press in. So we're back to local press and international press as well, inviting the press in and walking them through. This is how a vote comes in. <clears throat> when it is mailed in, it is separated from the signature. So when you come back for a vote count, people are like, well, where's the signature? The whole point of voting is it's a secret ballot. You have to separate it from the signature. So that signature has to be read, approved, and then the vote gets separated and that vote is valid. Just like when you show your license if you're coming in to vote, you know, that vote is then valid but separated from your license. So I think educating people, I have found that 
there are so many aha moments when people take the time to understand and learn. And that's why we did a whole series of videos. Again, back in 2020, you know, we're still, as Americans, we're used to getting our election results you know, moments after the polls close. And so even just the, basic of, the basis of telling people in 2020, you're not going to know the night of the election. It might take until the next day when all the votes come in. We had to start by, by having that conversation so people were not surprised when the election was one way one, the, night, the night after the polls closed and it switched the next day. And so that's all part of educating up until the process and then about the process. So I, uh, you know, I, I, have, I have to say that that is really the crux. Once people see how things actually work, they really can't question it, but it's hard to show you know, millions and millions of Americans who don't want to see it. So we well, have to I, th I think also against the backdrop of of the relentless messaging yeah. that comes out through a variety of of social media streams that they're not that elections aren't credible right. is so so deeply damaging. Um, and right. as I said, you know, 16 states that still have election deniers, and this is why it will be you know in in governor, AG, secretary of state positions. This is why it will be absolutely critical that we don't, we don't sit back after the midterms and say, oh, threat right. is over. Um, but rather that we need, we need to buckle up and, and go deeper. Uh, and w one of the questions is, you know, what are we, what, uh, what do we learn from the midterms that we can take forward to the uh, 24 election? And I, I, I think it's really that we, we need to look at what worked, which is a combination of all these things of right. beefing up um, our election administration resources, uh, working on election security, helping to get ahead of mis and disinformation, uh, forestalling bad state laws from being enacted. You know, there's a roster right. of things that happened by a whole community of people who mobilized, and the American people got out and right. voted, um, and voted in a greater number than, than I think people had feared against election denialism. Uh, but we can't let up. I mean, right. that really needs to be something that everybody takes on board as an important approach and make sure that the violence continues to be delegitimized and um, deterred as much as possible. Yeah, and, and you can't lose because there's voter suppression, but your neighbor won, you know, in the same party, and you can't claim suppression on one side if, if it, it doesn't go across, you know. So that is also the proof of registering voters. Again, these are not things the Carter Center does, but we've seen the benefit of registering voters and making sure they understood what their rights are uh, and the you know and making sure they have the right and making sure they have the rights and you know, people made there's a lot to be said about the Georgia SB202 the law that that was put in place after the election to fix what was broken in 2020 when nothing was broken the secretary of state even said nothing was broken yet they fixed that law but it did codify things like early voting and mail-in voting and, thing, and drop boxes. And these are things that did not exist previously to COVID. I mean, or they existed, but they weren't codified in law. So there have been a lot of positive and good laws that have come out. There have been ne some negatives too, but there have been a lot of negatives. But a lot of laws have actually codified the, the good parts of our election system. And you know, President Carter and uh, Secretary Baker had done a report back 15 years ago where you know, the, the last administration questioned the fact that President Carter and, and Secretary uh, Baker had said mail-in voting could be fraudulent. Well, they said that in 2010. I mean, you know, things have changed. You know, Oregon has moved to total mail-in mail voting. And so you know, the, what we talked about, we're now talking, we do a series every year now with the Baker Institute to talk about how that report on the Bipartisan Commission on Election Reform, how it's relevant now and what needs to change. And I think those conversations are gonna continue because that's an important element of the work. So we just have a few minutes left, and this is a good question to end on, which is what message can we give young people on these issues? Mm. Um, and um, 
I'll take a stab at it and let you have the last word page. Yeah. But I think that it's, it's, um, it's easy to disparage American democracy. I think there is a critique that talks with, with merit on some of the built-in inequities that have plagued our countries, particularly around uh, racial issues from its very inception. But there is so much to build on and, and to renew and fulfill, as President Obama talks about, the, fulfill the promise of democracy. And there are, I go back to the democracy is the miracle that enables us to live with people with whom we disagree. It will take everybody leaning into the challenge. It will take young people caring about this issue. And we've seen how young people have been just core important voters mm -hmm. who are exercising their civic duty. And so I would encourage them to continue to do that and to commit to f making American democracy realize its full potential because it will be up to all of us. Right. It's hard to follow that. Uh, I'll just say I have three kids of voting age, so they're not really kids anymore. Um, but uh, what I have said to them and what they truly feel is, you know, voting is it's a right, it's a privilege, and you can't take it for granted. And it's up to them to share that with their friends and to be engaged. And so, you know, it is. I feel it's the next generation that is going to solve many of these problems. But they have to have the conversation. They have to be willing to. Uh, and so, you know, I remain bullish on our democracy. I think it is. It's it's trending in the positive, in a positive way because I think we came very close to the edge. And so I yeah. think it's fragile. It's always going to be fragile. It's an experiment. It's been a 200 plus year experiment and we're learning as we go. But I, I remain hopeful that we're in, going in the right direction. So, you know, just a final coda is um, it's, it's interesting to look around the world. Um, I had um, an international colleague make this point is that if the United States can't make it as a multiracial democracy, um, especially as we see migration changing the face of so many countries around the world. Um, if the United States can't make it work, there's little hope that it can work anywhere else. So the challenge is not just for our own country, but really for enabling that example to be, to be seen around the world. Um, and so the stakes are pretty high, and I agree with you. I think we did come back from the edge. Uh, I think the midterms could have gone really sideways and really in the wrong direction. And now we all need to stay super focused. Right. Um, not out of the woods. We're not out of the woods. That's probably the key message. Right. Thank you, everybody, for your Thank questions. You. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, and uh, stay with it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.